Hey, good evening, everybody. It's Pastor Mike here for Harvest Family Fellowship and our live broadcast on Friday evenings. Uh, we're going through the Book of Romans. Um, hope you guys have had a, a good week. Let me see if I can find where we're at here. Um, been kind of a weird week. Huh? We've had snow this week, cold temperatures, warm temperatures. Um, but uh, spring, you know, will be here permanently very soon. Um, and I'm looking forward to a lot warmer weather, nicer weather. So uh, we're going to be uh, going through the the um, excuse me the seventh chapter of Romans tonight, and I really like the seventh chapter um, because it sets up chapter eight really well. And, and chapter eight is um, is really good. Um, everything Paul has to say in Romans is so good and. And so I'm really looking forward to talking tonight. Um, I just want to preface, uh, you know, our reading of Romans 7 by saying, or by asking a question, and, um, you know, you guys can just think about it. You know, do you ever feel just like you're on a treadmill? Like you're trying to do the right thing uh, in your life. You're trying to do what you know God would want you to do. And you just feel like you keep failing. You just the treadmill's turned up way too fast, and you just can't keep up. Um, I feel like that a lot. Like I feel like, you know, I know the right things I should do. I, I know um, the things that I shouldn't do, and yet I end up doing these things. I end up doing things I shouldn't do. I end up not doing things that I should do. And Paul is going to basically say the same thing tonight. And I find it really. Um, encouraging that somebody who who met Jesus okay he met Jesus on the road to Damascus you remember if you've read the book of Acts and he knew he was a contemporary of, of you know Peter and 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 John and and uh, Jesus some of Jesus's brothers James and Jude and it's just encouraging to me that someone like that someone like Paul who by all accounts um, had uh, no reason whatsoever um, to doubt the things of God and, and the truth of Jesus Christ, he still uh, fell short of God's glory. As he said, you know, back in Romans 3.23, you know, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul, even Paul, uh, fell short and he wasn't afraid to admit it. And so I just find that really encouraging. So... Uh, with that said, let's let's get right into Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read uh, through the first six verses. And it says, starting in verse 1, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. And that makes sense, right? If you're dead, you know, you can't keep the law anyway, so it has no authority over you. For example, he says, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. Okay, and Paul is just giving that example. It's not... You know, it's just an example. He's not um, saying that's the the best example. It's just one example of how the law uh, doesn't apply if someone's dead. Okay, and then in verse four he says, "So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who raised from the who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God." And what Paul is saying is really significant. And it really, I'm going to be honest, it wasn't until today when I was reading through this again that it clicked into place for me what Paul is saying. Um, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But, but what he's saying here is that we died to the law when Jesus died. Okay, When Jesus died, he was the substitute. Uh, you know, he... he he was the substitutional sacrifice for our sin. And when he died, we died to the law. Okay, and I'll, sh I'll explain how that works in a minute. Um, 
But he says, it's so that we might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. And listen to this, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Um, when human beings were under the law, they were so consumed with trying to follow the law that I don't know that they could really bear much good fruit because they were so worried about not doing this or making sure that they did that and they weren't really focused on doing good things for God. Okay, That's what Paul is trying to say here. He says in verse 5, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. And so what he's saying is when we're in the realm of the flesh, our sinful passions were actually aroused by the law, okay? And that's true. Like, if you know something's against the law, what's the first thing you want to do? You know, like, if I tell you, you know, this is kind of a silly example, but it's one Pastor Harry uh, gave last night at Bible study, or the other night at Bible study, excuse me, he said, if I say Shrek, what are you guys going to think of? Well, you're going you're gonna to immediately think of a big green ogre, uh, that's in love with a, with a princess that's that's out of his league, right? Um, and it's the same thing with the law. When the law tells us, you know, thou shalt not covet, what is the first thing we want to do? We want we want to have what our neighbor neighbor has. You know, the law arouses those sinful passions and desires in us, and they bear fruit unto death. Meaning, you know, just what Paul said in three twenty three. You know, the uh, uh, or it was. A, Right after 3.23, he said, um, the wages of sin is death, okay? And that's, that's what happens when we sin, we, we elicit death in our life, okay? So he says in verse 6, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Okay. So I want to try to explain how this works and why it's important. Um, Jesus was the substitutionary uh, sacrifice for us. He took the penalty of, of all this, the world's sin and, and he, he took it with him to the cross. He died and he kicked the devil's butt and he overcame death. Okay, So sin, we, we're dead to sin because of that. He already dealt with sin. He dealt with all the sin of everybody that ever lived before him, anybody that was alive when he was alive, and anybody that would ever come after him. He took care of their sin. If, if they simply just say yes to Jesus, okay? And so he's dealt with my sin. He's already paid the price for any sin I'll ever commit, He's dealt with it. I'm dead to it. My spirit is dead to sin. Okay, my fleshly body, okay, wants to sin, but my spirit is dead to it. It's you know, it's dead to sin. It's alive in Christ. Okay, and so what that what that means is that sin uh, has no hold over us anymore. You know. And the implication of that is is amazing. What it does is is the fact that we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. Okay, it means that we are freed up from having to dwell on the law every day of our lives. We are freed up to simply say, God, what good things would you want me to do today? And then be obedient to that and do those things, even though we might mess up here or there. You know, we don't have, what we, what it does for us is we get to serve God by loving other people and doing his will. And we don't have to feel guilty when we mess up because Jesus has already taken care of it. And it's freeing. It's so freeing when you realize that the, that you don't have to follow the law. You just have to follow Jesus' example. You read the gospels and you see how Jesus loved people and you just you just live your life that way not imitating it okay not imitating Christ but actually embodying who Christ was and it's only when we realize that we are dead to the law that the law is
is no longer our master, but our master is Jesus Christ. And our conscience is the Holy Spirit. And, and so I really want you to think about that. Like, you don't have to be on a treadmill of, of trying to overcome your sin. Because I'm going to tell you why. When you are the, the Jews, okay, my, if you read, there's 613 Levitical laws, okay, in, in the Old um, Testament. And, um, you know, a lot of those laws were intended to make sure that the Jews treated each other fairly, okay? Some of them, many of the laws, had nothing to do with holiness, okay? M many of them did, but many of them did not. And so the Jews were hyper-focused on following the letter of the law, that they missed the intent of the law. The intent of the law was to cause them to love their neighbor. Instead, they were just focusing on, okay, I can't do that, I've got to do that, I'm not supposed to do that thing over there, I've got to do that thing, now i really got to do that. Their motivation wasn't love. Their motivation was obligation to God's law. Excuse me. And that is the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant we live in. We are, we get to be focused on loving people. With the understanding that yes, we're going to mess up, but it's okay. God knows we're going to mess up. He's already dealt with our sin. Our job is just to love people, to be obedient to, to the specific things He wants us to do in the lives of other people. Not, how can I make sure that I don't, you know, break this law or that law. Because I'm telling you what, if you spent any amount of time trying to follow the law of God, you wouldn't have any time to love people. You wouldn't have any time to love people. Um, so I hope that explains it a little bit. And I'm just going to read the rest of the chapter um, and then just talk about it a little bit. Uh, because Paul kind of goes on a, a rant here, but it's an important rant. He says, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Actually, let me stop there. Paul, What Paul says there is absolutely true. The law informs us where we fall short. That's really the only purpose. If you're a Christian today and you're living under the new covenant, the only purpose the law has in your life is to show you just how much you fall short. It's not to make you feel guilty. It's not to make you feel bad about yourself. It's to show you I really need Jesus in my life because I fall short. And with Jesus in my life, I can overcome. Okay? That's the purpose of the law. And, and it's right, we wouldn't know what sin was if it weren't for the law. We would just, you know, um, you know, people before, uh, before Abraham uh, made a covenant with God, and then, you know, he had sons, all the way right down to Joseph. Uh, and then Moses comes on the scene, and they get the law, right? Before all of that covenantal beginnings of Judaism people had no idea what was wrong and what was right they just did what they felt they just did what they wanted to the law shows us where we fall short okay verse 8 but sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of coveting for apart from the law sin was dead once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Um, so Paul is basically just kind of building upon his initial you know, hypothesis there, which is that you know, the commandments of the law that are intended to help us to live life better actually bring death into our life if that's what we choose to follow. They just perpetuate our sinful nature because we dwell, uh, we dwell on our sin instead of dwelling on the Father.
Okay? So, verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be re recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. <clears throat> Let me just pause there and say, Paul says something very powerful. He says, the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And if you don't know Jesus, but you try to follow the law, that's exactly what you are. You're a slave to sin. And then Paul starts to go on this rant I was talking about. And he says, I don't understand what I do. How many of you guys have ever felt like that? Like, you do something really stupid. Like something you know you shouldn't have done. And you're just like, I don't understand why I keep doing these things. Right? I mean, you can just pull your hair out. Because you're like, why do I keep doing these stupid things in my life? I feel like that all the time. And I hope that there's somebody out there listening that, that can relate to that. Um, you know, and Paul just, he says it so wonderfully. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. You know? And now I, I will tell you, you know, th there was a time in my life where I was actively addicted to pornography. And I'm going to try not to get emotional because it's a time in my life that I, that I hate and I wish had never happened. But I would watch, you know, some of this content online and I would get done and I would hate myself. I would hate myself. I would literally loathe myself. And I would think, Michael, you're the, you're the most disgusting human being on the face of the earth. I hated what I was doing. And when I sin today and other, you know, now I've found other ways to be sinful. I think we all, you know, do that. But I hate that just as much. I hate... You know, I hate when I'm mean or short with people I care about. I hate that. Um, it, you know, I just, I hate what I, what I, what I do. Um, but like Paul, the things that I hate, I end up doing. Okay, I can relate to Paul. Okay, so verse 16. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Okay, and that's true. When we sin, we realize, yep, the law is good and I'm not. Okay, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. And what Paul, I never understood that either till today. What Paul is saying, he's talking about this battle between our flesh man and our spirit man. Our spirit man, okay, he's not the one that does this. Our spirit doesn't commit these sins. It's our flesh. It's our fleshly desires. And so if you're a new creation in Christ and you're living according to the Holy Spirit, and you're, you're, you're living in your spirit, your spirit is relating to God, when your flesh does something dumb, it's not really you, because that's not who you are anymore. Paul isn't, look, look, Paul, I, when I read this, when I've read this passage before, I'm like, okay, Paul, you're kind of making excuses, and kind of, you know, trying to, like, take yourself off the hook and not take responsibility. That's not what Paul's saying. He knows he's fully responsible for it, but the person he is in Christ is not the person that's doing it. See, what we do is we, we, we slide back in to that flesh man that, and, and we, we choose to let that flesh man for a period of time control our actions and our choices instead of le instead of letting our spirit relate to God's spirit and be guided into the right things we slip back into that flesh and that's what Paul's saying he's saying it's not really me because I'm not that person anymore 
Okay, Paul, and Paul had, you know, look, Paul had the most drastic conversion of, that I can think of, okay? Paul was a murderer of Christians, quite literally. He killed Christians, and he met Jesus, and he, he was changed, and he stopped killing Christians, and he started loving them, and he started teaching Jews to love Jesus. So Paul is qualified to say this. He knows what it means to live by the flesh. Okay. Uh, okay. Verse 18, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that, it, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So he's talking about, I have... He's got the desire to do good. His soul desires to do good, but his flesh is an impediment to that. Okay? That's what he's saying. Um, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing, which I, is how I feel all the time. And he says, Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work in me. Or at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You know, that's how I feel. Like, my goodness, I feel like that all the time, guys. Like, when I do wrong, I'm just like, what an awful, wretched human being I am, right? You guys ever felt that way? Like, I'm just awful. Paul says it so poetically. Let me read it again. He, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But then he says this. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Again, there Paul is making that comparison. In his mind, in his soul, he's a slave to God's law. He's a slave to doing what God wants him to do. But in his flesh, he's a slave to sin. And that is, folks, that is that is a struggle that that may never completely go away but I'm telling you that if you don't let the voice of the enemy tell you that you're awful when you make a mistake and you keep striving to live for Christ that spirit man will win out more and more in your life and so I encourage you don't let the voice of the enemy try to tell you you're not good enough or that you're disgusting you know yeah, I'm a wretched man, but but in Jesus Christ, I'm a son of God. Okay? You are sons and daughters of God. If you excuse me, if you know Jesus Christ. And so I, I'm gonna let Paul speak for you know for Paul and, and but I, I just um I hope that um this was helpful. I hope that you can see that there's this internal conflict going on in all of us. But if we, if but if we just say yes to Jesus more and more, that sinful, fleshly man will eventually die for good. He will be, you know, he will eventually. He won't even speak up. Um, and we, you know, I believe that it's very possible to live completely for Jesus without sin in your life. Um, not probable, maybe, but possible. And so I don't become discouraged. Don't let the voice of the enemy tell you you're not good enough because you are. And so let me just pray for you and encourage you. Father, I know that there is somebody listening um, that that feels like Paul did. What a wretched man or what a wretched woman I am. You know, uh, we all feel that way. And I, I, so Lord, I just want to pray for this person or persons. And I pray that you would tell them, yeah, 
you might be a wretched person in your flesh. But you're a new creation in Jesus Christ, and I love you, child. I pray that you would tell them that, Father. That you, that you love them, and that their wretched state of being doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is if we say yes to Jesus. If we go, yep, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe He died for me. If we just confess that, it doesn't matter how much we mess up. Lord, I just want to encourage everybody listening that they would press into you when they're feeling discouraged, when they're feeling happy. Just all the time, Lord. Um, Lord, I pray that people's experience with you would become like that of Enoch, who uh, we're going to be talking about on Sunday, Lord, but that Enoch walked with you. He walked with you faithfully, Lord. He, he, he consistently met with you every day. He consistently talked to you every day. He had a relationship with you that was so um, wonderful that you took him to heaven before he experienced death. I pray that people would see that that is available to them, especially now in this new covenant that we have because of what Jesus did for us. I pray you would help us to walk with you. So Lord, I just thank you and I praise you for every single person listening, Lord. I, I thank you that, that they tuned in. I pray that they know they're loved. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, I, I thank you guys for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. I hope it was encouraging and uplifting. Um, I, I'll remind you as always that church on Sunday is at 10 o'clock. Um, and... Anybody, absolutely anybody's welcome. I don't care, um, you know, what your background is, what your history is, you're welcome. Uh, Harvest Family Fellowship is a safe place uh, for people to come as they are. Um, so I just, I hope to see you guys on Sunday. Um, have a great weekend and, and God bless.